Tom studied chemistry at the University of Pittsburgh and neuroscience at Caltech, where he earned his doctorate for, from UCSD in anthropology, with an emphasis on psychological anthropology. And there he studied altered states of consciousness and religious conversion. He has taught anthropology courses on religion, the environmental crisis, and mental illness and deviance. And today, he will be discussing his previous research on ibogaine and his long-term outcome study of ibogaine-assisted treatment for opiate dependence. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. So uh, today, I'm really happy to be here with, with Sandy Hartman, who's going to be uh, following up on talk. Oh, microphone. Hello, is this one? Yeah. So I'm, today I'm very happy to be here with Sandy Hartman, who drove up from Playa de Tijuana and uh, is running an aftercare house there for people who've undergone Ibogaine treatment. And she'll be following up my talk with some words of her own. So um, I'll mostly be talking about this study that's funded by MAPS that started in September. And the uh, PI on the study is Valerie Majeko. And I'm a co-investigator, also involved in the study is uh, Rishi, who's a student at the California Institute of Integral Studies, and his advisor, Dr. Meg Jordan. Okay. So the main question that we're looking at in our long-term study is, can ibogaine therapy facilitate long-term recovery from addiction? And um, the, one of the main things here is that it's long-term. As I'll show you, we have some evidence from other studies that shows that Ibogaine is very good at interrupting addiction on the short term and giving people who are addicted to opiates and other substances a chance, an opportunity to recover from their addiction. So the uh, overall outline for today is I'm going to talk about what is Ibogaine, uh, I'm assuming that some of you don't know much about Ibogaine, and why are we looking at it uh, as a treatment for addiction? Why is it being used as a pre treatment for addiction? And uh, I'll look at a little bit at some of the previous studies that have been done and the history of Ibogaine, and also very briefly look at some other psychedelics that have been used in uh, treatment of addiction, and as a way of looking at the question of whether or not the trip itself uh, makes a difference in the addiction recovery. Does it matter, or is it just a biochemical sort of phenomenon. And then I'll do an overview of the uh, study design for the uh, long-term outcome study. So first of all, what is Ibogaine and why are we looking at it as a treatment for addiction? Uh, here's a picture of the chemical structure of Ibogaine. It's an indole alkaloid and also qualifies as a tryptamine. Uh, and it's originally derived from a Western African shrub uh, called Iboga. And it was derived in 1901 chemically, and then, uh, as I'll, I'll talk about the history more of it, the, um, it's also a psychedelic. It produces a very intense long-term trip, uh, sometimes upwards of 30 hours, and uh, as described by Sasha Shulgin in Tikal, it's a very rough trip, both physically and mentally. And it's also a Schedule One substance, and as our, just, uh, just uh, described by our previous speaker, that means that it's officially classified as something that has a high potential for abuse and is uh, as, yes, uh, the irony is really thick, and also has no medicinal value. So Ibogaine, I think, is probably the, the substance that's at the other pole for that. Of, of all the substance one, or Schedule one substances, it's probably at the other pole for that. And here's a picture of the uh, Iboga shrub that uh, is uh, the main source of, of Ibogaine. And um, a little bit of history on the treatment of uh, Ibogaine uh, uh, for uh, treatment of uh, addiction for Ibogaine. It was uh, serendipitously discovered by Howard Lotsoff, who's pictured here, who passed away earlier this year, and back in January. And in 1962, he was living in New York City, and he was uh, also addicted to heroin and ahead of the curve in terms of trying lots of psychedelics, only 19 years old, and he'd gotten hold of some Ibogaine, and, uh, it was a, which was a really relatively minor player in the psychedelic 60s, and here it is in the early 60s, and he's got some. And he tried it, he was intrigued by the idea of the 30-hour trip, and he woke up after this long trip and, and had getting some sleep afterwards, he woke up and realized he had, for the first time in a long time, 
had no uh, craving for heroin and had no withdrawal symptoms. And uh, I'm trying to paraphrase here, but he also uh, said at the time, or in later publications, he said this was the first time in a long time that he felt no fear. And he thought there must be something to this. So um, also at that time, uh, around that same time, Claudio Naranjo, a Chilean uh, psychiatrist, was using it in psychotherapy, and he described it as some, being something that would help speed up psychotherapy, and it was very good at uh, opening up uh, uh, memories that people had really forgotten about or, or were, were not dealing with. Um, and in uh, the late 80s, uh, Lotsoff started to treat other people uh, with, uh, with Ibogaine, and after that, or around that same time, there was the rise of the uh, informal Ibogaine treatment scenes in the Netherlands and also in the U.S. Um, so a little bit more about Howard Lotsoff. After he had that experience in 1962, over the next year or so, he was trying different psychedelics with a group of, uh, of people that he knew in New York City, and he administered Ibogaine to 20 of those people, uh, seven of whom were addicted to heroin. And all seven of them uh, reported relief of the withdrawal and craving for heroin. And five of those seven maintained abstinence for six months or longer, according to Lotsoff. And the other two, he says, really weren't interested in, in breaking their addiction anyway. So uh, now uh, I'm going to skip through a lot of these slides. I I'm, have way too many slides here. So uh, self-help groups uh, sprung up in the Netherlands and uh, also uh, in the US in New York City uh, because in 1970, since uh, Ibogaine was declared Schedule I, uh, it could only be used in countries where it wasn't declared illegal, such as the Netherlands, or underground in, the, in other countries, such as the US. Um, Eric Taub was also a very uh, prominent, uh, actually still is, a very prominent uh, provider of Ibogaine treatments. Uh, he treated over 100 people, well over 100 people in the Caribbean, and uh, says that about 70% uh, of the people in their 20s or 30s uh, returned to their prior drug of attendance and, and a smaller percentage of those in their 40s and 50s. And this is important because uh, it's very consistently, that, uh, it's very consistent uh, that Ibogaine will break the addiction on the short term. But what's happening on the long term? That's why we're, we're looking at this in the, in the, in the MAP study. Um, so Taub views Ibogaine as creating a window of opportunity uh, of diminished craving for several months after treatment. Um, it's not clear for me, to me that it's several months, but uh, he's saying that this is a, a, a window of opportunity during which time uh, involvement in aftercare is essential to produce, prevent eventual relapse. And that's part of why I'm really glad that Sandy's here, because she's involved with aftercare and has her own experience of Ibogaine treatment that she, she'll be telling you about. Um, it's a window of opportunity, and what happens during that window of opportunity, what the, the social support network, what's, whether you have to go back to work, uh, all sorts of things determine whether or not you're able to maintain abstinence. Okay, so um, there are animal studies that were done in the 80s uh, showing that uh, Ibogaine is able to reduce uh, the animal's um, self-administration of many different substances, including alcohol and opiates, and um, they're also showing that it resolves uh, withdrawal symptoms and, and, and the uh, animals, the animal models of withdrawal. I'm not sure how you tell whether an animal is in withdrawal, but um, the uh, pharmacological mechanisms are unclear. Uh, this is uh, according to Stanley Glick and Ken Alper, who have both done research in, the, in, this, in this field. Um, so the mechanisms aren't clear. and. Uh, uh, but it seems to work in animals as well as humans. Um, formal human studies uh, have, have been few, but um, they have shown that there's resolution of withdrawal symptoms uh, in the vast majority of subjects. Uh, this is uh, work by Ken Alper and, uh, and his team and Deborah Mash at the University of Miami in St. Kitts. Uh, and Mash's study was, was aborted early due to lack of funding. So uh, even though she had a, a large study going on and was going to produce uh, results for a, a much larger number of uh, subjects than we're studying, uh, she hasn't reported that data. We have data for one month out. Uh, it's also notable to, to, that he, she 
found that uh, depression uh, was resolved for a lot of people that she was using something called the Beck Depression Inventory, which we are uh, using the MAP study as well. So um, it's, Ibogaine seems to have an antidepressant effect as well. Okay. Um, so to summarize all that, does Ibogaine work? I, I'm convinced that it does. Now, the, the, in the short term, we're seeing that it resolves uh, craving and addiction, that attenu it attenuates those greatly. And um, there's a great deal of anecdotal evidence that it works. Thousands of people have been treated for addiction with, with Ibogaine, and it seems to work. Um, but the question is really, how well does it work in the long term? And um, we're really lacking good data on that, on the long-term efficacy of that. So that's why we're doing the study. And um, let's see, um, Ibogaine, uh, there is some dispute about how well, how it works. Uh, the, clearly there's some kind of biochemical mechanism as shown in the animal studies. And um, a lot of researchers and practitioners agree that, that, that also there is some kind of psycho-spiritual aspect to this and that the, what happens to the people who are taking it psychologically and spiritually makes a big difference in whether or not they recover from their addiction. Okay, so I want to be very brief here because I want to stop, talk more about the study, but there have been other uh, psychedelics that have been studied in their uh, ability to resolve addiction, and uh, including LSD and ketamine, uh, dipropyltryptamine, ayahuasca and psilocybin, and um, it's hard to generalize the, f the findings, but it does seem to work. And I'm going to scroll through some of the, uh, the studies that I've got here. Um, so LSD in the treatment of alcoholism. Uh, recently, Erica uh, Dyke, who's at the University of Alberta, uh, summarized a lot of the uh, research that had been done in Canada on LSD to treat alcoholism. And um, uh, she concluded that uh, the psychiatrists that did these studies were correct in thinking that what's happening for people is that the, the LSD experience gives them a chance to see their own un unhealthy behavior in a more objective light and to uh, uh, turn around their lives, much like uh, the, the DT experience can uh, do when people hit rock bottom. Uh, so here's the structure of LSD. Uh, it's a I won't go into details of why it's a tryptamine and, and, and so on, but I want to show you how similar it is in structure to Ibogaine, which is also a, uh, a tryptamine. Um, now, both of these seem to be useful in, in treating addiction, but Ibogaine has the advantage uh, over these other uh, tryptamines and other psychedelics of attenuating those withdrawal symptoms and the cravings, which is really vastly important when you're dealing with a heinous addiction like, like heroin or other opiates. So, um, and this is a structure of 18MC. We can talk about that in questions and answers if anybody has any questions about this. This is a, an analog of, it, it's very similar to uh, Ibogaine. It's developed to be able to be doing the same things to addiction that Ibogaine does without having the trip. And um, in animal studies, it seems to work very well. Now, um, it hasn't been tried in humans, so uh, it's, it's not clear whether it, that it would work in humans. And would it work without having people go through the, the, the psychedelic experience? That's not, that's a big question mark. So um, now to uh, move on to the outcome study and the, the protocol design. Uh, Valerie and I were just down in, uh, in Entenada yesterday. Valerie Majeko and I were just down there yesterday um, to do a site visit for a, a clinic that we are going to be included in the, including in the study, uh, uh, actually probably as early as next week. Uh, but um, uh, the overall objective of the study is to uh, look at the effectiveness of Ibogaine in uh, reducing scores on the addiction severity index and over a 12-month pe period. So we're going to be, um, and are already, uh, administering the ASI to people before treatment and then after treatment at, at one-month <coughs> intervals for a full year. Uh, we're also secondarily going to be looking at a uh, 
scale called the States of Consciousness Questionnaire, which is also used by Griffiths and his uh, mystical experiences in psilocybin study um, to see whether or not there is some correlation between the intensity of the uh, subjective experience of the Abigail uh, and the uh, success in, in uh, treating the addiction. Uh, okay, so we're also using the subjective opioid withdrawal scale or SOUS to see if uh, withdrawal symptoms are, are, uh, are knocked off with the Abigail as well. Uh, now we're also uh, in a study amendment that we just submitted in, on December 1st. Uh, we're adding in the Beck depression inventory to see if the depression scores are reduced as they were in Deborah Mash's uh, study. And we're going to be doing that on monthly, interval, on monthly intervals as well, uh, before and after treatment. And um, we're also going to be using the uh, TIEQUE to track emotional intelligence uh, changes, in which uh, EI has been, uh, or low scores have been uh, shown to predict uh, uh, substance abuse uh, likelihood. So uh, we'll be interested in seeing what happens with that. So our initial design was to uh, follow 30 subjects for one year uh, before treatment and then monthly for 12 months after. And um, we're doing the other measures, uh, uh, some of them before treatment and um, some of them only after this, the uh, States of Consciousness questionnaire is administered while they're still at the clinic and uh, shortly after their Ibogaine treatment so that's still fresh in their minds. Um, the initial uh, interviews I'm doing mostly in person. Uh, I find that it gives me a better rapport with, with, the, with the patients. Uh, I have done one of the initial interviews by Skype video. Uh, the follow-up calls are all being uh, done by telephone. And we are hoping that we have a control group uh, that would be people who come to the clinic but are denied treatment for medical reasons. Uh, and I can go into that and question and answers if anyone has any, any questions about that. But um, here is the, the study site for the the first five subjects that uh, we've enrolled. Um, so we've got 25 more to enroll. This is in Playa de Tijuana, which is where Sandy's living. Not at the clinic, but she's living nearby there. And um, so as I said, on December 1st, we submitted a protocol amendment. And we're adding things that are listed here, including drug testing, to verify what the subjects are telling us about their drug use from month to month. Um, they have a choice. Uh, we're going to encourage them to do the hair testing because it has a, a much longer sensitivity. It's uh, uh, sensitive to, to detect uh, these different substances over months rather than just a few days. And we're adding in the Beck Depression Inventory and, as I said, uh, the, this uh, test of emotional intelligence. And we're also adding in the, the additional site, this place that uh, Valerie and I visited yesterday in Ensenada. And I'm happy to say that when Valerie and I were there, visiting with the clinic director and being shown this, this magnificent place that we found that we got approval for the amendment. So uh, we're going to move ahead with that as soon as we can and it looks like we're have a, we'll have a, a subject ready at that clinic as early as Monday. Uh, here's a picture of the, the clinic site and uh, as you can see it's really a rough thing to have to go to these dingy drab places as part of the research, uh, but I will carry on. So, um, uh, let's see. Uh, the inclusion criteria for subjects, this is an, the, the entire list, but I, I bolded the one that I think is most important. Uh, participants have to be seeking treatment primarily for opiate dependence. Uh, many of them, most of them are poly drug users, but they have to be coming primarily for uh, their uh, dependence on opiates. Um, there are a few other things there that I won't go into right now, but um, exclusion criteria, um, if you've been treated with Ibogaine before for any reason, then you can't be in the study. We're, we're only going to be including uh, Ibogaine naive subjects. And this is a list of the measures that I've already gone over. And this is a, a schedule of all the different uh, uh, measures as I have already gone over, so I won't, I'll just skip over that. And to conclude uh, this talk, I want to um, talk about other po possible determinants of the outcomes following the interruption of addiction. Um, 
as I was saying, it looks like Ibogaine is really successful at interrupting addiction on the short term and giving people that window of opportunity where they can uh, really turn their lives around and stop using and when they get back to uh, their lives after leaving the clinic or leaving after leaving aftercare, uh, hopefully they can uh, continue to uh, abstain from their, their drug use or their uh, opiate use anyway. So uh, we're looking at the, uh, the dosage and administration of Ibogaine. So uh, some people get a flood dose, which is a very strong dose, and some people will, uh, are depending on some of the, the uh, biochemical tests and the EKGs that are done before they get their treatment, they might be getting a lower dose, um, uh, or they might be getting several lower doses. And so we're, we're logging all those things and seeing if that has any, uh, if the, the differences in, in dosing have any, uh, sort of uh, make any sort of difference in their outcomes. And also um, the, the set and setting at the clinic, we're not doing anything to measure this or, or try to include this in the study in any way, but it, I think it's worth noting that uh, both clinics are very welcoming, very warm, non-judgmental environments and uh, uh, person after person that I've met who have uh, been at these clinics, uh, primarily at the first one in, in Playa de Tijuana, um, tell me that they really love the staff. They felt like they were taken care of beautifully, and that makes a big difference, I think, in, in, in the outcomes. Um, aftercare is also critically important. And, oh, okay. Uh, so I'll, as, as, uh, I'll use that as a way of transitioning to, to uh, Sandy's talk. So. Um, when people have to go back to their jobs uh, after they get out of the uh, treatment or when they get back uh, to their, their lives back home and they've got someone living with them who's using uh, opiates, uh, it's much harder, obviously, to, uh, to keep that abstinence going. And so um, with that, I'd like to introduce to you Sandy Hartman, who is running an aftercare house in, in Tijuana, and um, I'm just delighted that she's here today. So, thank you.